Welcome to the closing plenary of the 114th Annual Meeting of the Society. Before we begin, I'm happy to announce that more than 2,000 people have registered for this meeting, making it the largest ASL annual meeting on record. Congratulations, everyone. Please do join us for the special toast that we have arranged at the conclusion of this session. So let me begin by thanking our sponsors, the Asser Institute for International and European Law, the Embassy of the Netherlands in the United States, and the Municipality of The Hague for sponsoring and working with us to organize this session. This partnership, now in its ninth year, has enriched our discussions by bringing prominent figures from The Hague and around the world to do the annual meeting. On behalf of the Society, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Ernst Hirsch Allen, President of the Asser Institute and a former Justice Minister of the Netherlands, who's been a key partner in this collaboration and a frequent participant in these sessions. He will be stepping down as President of the Institute this year but I know he will continue to be an active member of the society and we look forward to continuing our close relationship with him. It is now my honor to introduce Saskia Brownis, the deputy mayor of the municipality of The Hague and a longtime friend of the society to welcome you to this session. Ladies and gentlemen, as a deputy mayor of the city of The Hague, I am glad this esteemed panel will discuss the promise of cities in relation to international law. As a representative of the International City of Peace and Justice, this subject is of course close to my heart. The Hague fully supports the good work of international organizations like the United Nations and national governments organizations which make cooperation at global level possible. But it is in fact that now, for the first time in history, the majority of the world's citizens lives in cities. In essence, the world is one big interconnected city. Cities are becoming increasingly important actors in international affairs and diplomacy. Yes, there still is a lot of darkness in the world, but I also see shining lights. Sadly enough, there are, in essence, many George Floyds in our global village whose basic rights are trampled. But we have also seen the recent acts of solidarity by so many people in city streets, in Minneapolis and New York, but also in Berlin, in Amsterdam, in London, many other places. And yes, in my town, The Hague. Unfortunately, it remains a huge challenge to realize equal rights for every human being on this planet. Former President Barack Obama was right to quote Dr. King and state that the arc of the moral universe is long, but that it bends towards justice. Expert discussions like yours about international law and justice hopefully offer new insights. But we also need to bring the debates to the people in order for any solutions to succeed in real life. I would like to briefly share what The Hague can bring to the table. Justice is rooted in The Hague's DNA. As a host city of the first peace conferences in 1899 and 1907, we have provided a platform to make significant developments in the field of international law possible. In 1913, the Peace Palace opened its doors for international law, for justice. Today, The Hague is the proud home of more than 200 international organizations and NGOs who have developed a proven track record in creating a better and a more just world. But achieving justice requires much more than just the establishment of institutions. It is necessary to network and connect at a local level and international level with similar minds. And this is why The Hague created the Hague Humanity Hub, where NGOs can meet and form new alliances 
which lead to inspirational collaborations. And this is why we are a member of city networks, like the Global Parliament of Mayors and Eurocities. And this is why participating in this ASIL conference is so important for us. International law is a broad concept, which intertwines with human rights. It is therefore also important to include civil society in order to achieve international justice. And as the world struggles to get a grip on the coronavirus pandemic, it also finds itself confronted with human rights crisis. The justice workforce finds itself on the front line. Access to justice for marginalized communities is also a much greater challenge. People-centered justice approaches, such as the Access to Justice program offered by Hill, are needed more than ever. Local governments, as the eyes and the ears of their communities, have a vital role to play in ensuring the success of such initiatives. The Hague municipality is also taking its responsibility and actively engaging with Hill and is proud to facilitate such international justice movements. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I always have the feeling that when we speak about international law and related values, it is Eleanor Roosevelt who is looking over our shoulder. As she put it, without concerned citizen action to uphold rights close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world, in small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. I hope that these words will inspire the panel of this closing plenary, as well as those tuning in to the session from all around the world. Thank you to the Asser Institute in The Hague for being our key partner in organizing this panel discussion. And dear friends, when travel allows, please visit me in The Hague. You are always welcome in our home of international law. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Brownis. It is now my pleasure to introduce our convener for this session, Dr. Jana Nyman. Jana is a member of the board and academic director of the Asser Institute. She also serves as professor of history and theory of international law at the University of Amsterdam and is affiliated with its Amsterdam Center for International Law. Currently, she's the program leader of an initiative at the Asser Institute on the global city, challenges, trust, and the role of international law which consists of four PhD research projects. Together with Helmut Aust of the French Universität Berlin, Berlin, Professor Nyman co-chairs the ILA study group on the role of cities in international law. In short, she is the ideal person to convene this conversation on cities and subnational entities. What promise do they hold for international law? Dr. Nyman. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the closing plenary of the 2020 virtual annual meeting of the American Society of International Law. A warm welcome also on behalf of the city of The Hague. We just listened to the deputy mayor who kindly supports this plenary. My name is Janne Nijman. I'm the academic director of the Asser Institute in The Hague and professor of law in Amsterdam and Geneva. It is our great pleasure to be with you on this occasion, if only virtually. We are greatly appreciative of the leadership of the American society who managed to find a way to continue the annual meeting online and to have this closing plenary despite the extraordinary circumstances in the world today. That said, we miss you in the room. This annual meeting has had as an overall theme the promise of international law. And for this year's closing plenary, we thought of a relatively new and important phenomenon, the rise of the city in international law. What is the promise of international law for the city? And what is the promise of the city for international law? 
And also, where do these promises fall short? We will explore these questions from different angles and from different locations, I may add. To that end, I'm joined by four wonderful speakers. It's an honor to introduce them, uh, and I do so all at once. So in New York City, first, Penny Abavardena, New York City's Commissioner for International Affairs. She serves on, and I have to be selective here, the Board of Directors of the United Nations Development Corporation, and the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Cities and Urbanization. Also, Penny is a core member of the United Nations SDG Strategy and Action Hub. In Berlin, Helmut Aust, Professor of Law at the Freie Universität in Berlin and co-chair of the ILA study group on the role of cities in international law. His publications include a monograph on the law of global cities, published in 2017, and a collection on the globalization of urban governance, legal perspectives on SDG 11, which he co-edited with Anel Duplessis. Then Robert Lewis Lettington. He is chief of the land, housing and shelter section of the United Nations Human Settlement Program, UN Habitat in Nairobi, and formerly chief of the legislative unit. Robert is also secretary to the drafting committee of the uh, Habitat Assembly and represents UN Habitat on the Secretary General's working group on the UN call to action for human rights. Last, but certainly not least, Maurizio Rodas. And he served as mayor of Quito from 2014 to 2019. And as a mayor, he hosted the UN's Conference on Urban Sustainable Development, Habitat 3, in 2016. Maurizio also had an active leadership role in main, uh, a number of main city networks. For example, he was co-president of UCLG, the United Cities and Local Government Organization, and um, served in global boards such as the C40 Climate Change uh, Leadership Group. And he's currently uh, a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in the urban age, a time of planetary urbanization. Cities are stepping up in the face of global challenges. We see a crucial role for local authorities, typically in responding to the climate crisis, but also as we speak to the COVID crisis. We see the importance of cities as sites of worldwide Black Lives Matter and anti-racism movements. And we see city leadership on the implementation of human rights locally and globally. To bring this home, the role of the city in international law and government is changing, and vice versa. The fact that we dedicate the closing plenary at the American society to the relationship between cities and international law testifies to the significance of the topic. A discipline so state-centric as international law is going urban, and cities, in turn, are going international or global. They increasingly use international law and global policies to guide their local policies. So in the course of this hour, we will examine together this dynamic, how this relationship is changing, how the local and the global meet, interact, undermine, and reinforce each other. So let's start our examination with a short discussion of this premise, the changing relation between cities and international law and governments. So may I ask our esteemed panelists to share first some of their first-hand observations with respect to this change. And Penny, maybe I may start with you. Uh, you work in New York, and among all other things, New York City is, of course, the city where the former mayor Bloomberg said, while, cities, uh, while nations talk, cities act. And so how do you see the relationship between cities and international law and institutions change? Yanni, thank you so much. And first, it's a pleasure to be with this esteemed panel. And I want, that, I want to thank the American Society for International Law and the Municipality, municipality of The Hague for bringing us together today. Um, it's changed pretty significantly. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my agency. Um, we've been around for over 50 years. New York City hosts the largest diplomatic corps in the world. So not just the UN headquarters and the permanent missions, but also 116 consulates 
over 70 trade commissions. And historically, before I became commissioner, um, this agency focused on the operational. And, you know, to the point that, you know, you said about Mayor Bloomberg, uh, Mayor de Blasio um, decided to give us the opportunity with this agency to create an opportunity um, to influence, impact um, international policy and governance um, by showcasing what could be work, what is working in New York City. Um, you know, before I reflect on what happened, I do want to comment on what's happening in New York City right now. Um, we have been the epicenter of the pandemic um, in the United States. Um, we are, you know, just coming out of 100 days of quarantine starting um, this past Monday. We went into phase one. Next week, we are looking to get into phase two. So we are moving quickly into our recovery and reopen, but we're also living through an extraordinary social movement um, happening throughout the United States that was triggered by the death of um, George Floyd in Minnesota. Um, but this is really rethinking, relooking at our policing system in the United States. And so right now we're experiencing that ground up swell for a desire to change. Um, and the, you know, the de Blasio administration and what we have been no doing in New York City um, have been preparing for this moment, largely because if I go back to 2015, um, the mayor launched what's called One NYC, which is our development agenda for New York City, really looking at how do we look at equity in sustainability and resiliency. And what we did in 2015 is map it to the sustainable development goals. You know, the world community came through and mm -hmm. I know our colleagues um, on this panel will also talk about the SDGs quite a lot, but it was really important for us to see how what New York City was doing was grounded in what the global community was looking to do, whether it was around gender equity or water and sanitation. And so through this work that we've done around the sustainable development goals, we have been essentially participating in global conversations to help influence, right? So when you think about the changing nature of cities and international law, we're non-state actors, right? Mm -hmm. All the agreements that even, you know, guide my office, they're between nation states or member states at the UN, um, but we believe that there is an opportunity to influence that conversation. And in the US specifically, the Trump administration has given us an extraordinary opportunity to activate um, around that. The first moment was the Paris Climate Accord. We knew that the Trump administration was gonna pull out within 24 hours. New York City committed ourselves directly with an executive order to that, right? And one of the reasons New York City is unique is that we are as large, if not larger, than 141 countries. You know, we are host to this extraordinary diplomatic international community. And, you know, working with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, now we have over 400 U.S. cities. This is a bipartisan commitment to climate change. And the way that we act at the local level is impacting this larger global conversation. There's many more, um, there's many more uh, examples, including the Global Compact on Migration, mm -hmm. which we can talk about later. But really, it's about, for us as a non-state actor who is at the end of the day, reflective, the most reflective of what our community and our neighborhoods need, we believe our voice is critical in this, in this um, international conversation. Thank you so much, Penny. And indeed, we will come back to a number of the points that you mentioned. Uh, first, let's go, uh, Maurizio, to you, because uh, in a way, you, you are the embodiment of the change, right? As a mayor, you you sought, uh, you looked, uh, you turned to the global level, you, you hosted uh, th these important conversations. How do you look at that change? Well, first of all, thank you so much to the American Society of International Law, the Municipality of The Hague, and all of you for this invitation. I am delighted to be part of this uh, great group of panelists speaking today. Um, well, I think that uh, the role of a mayor should not only be focused on local action, but also in global action. Because actually, there are many uh, local action goals that, that are more easy to achieve through global action, right? Mm -hmm. So I think as a mayor, you should be looking at both. And that's what I try to do. I have always been a very big fan of what can be achieved through international uh, relations. And I think that that also applies for cities, not only for countries. Uh, as you mentioned, I had the privilege of uh, hosting uh, the Habitat 3 conference. We have here in Quito more than 500 mayors and local leaders uh, participating in this conference, which I think marked a very important milestone in terms of being the first 
a UN conference on urban sustainable development that had actually the participation of mayors. I mean, that sounds kind of paradoxical, right? But in the first two editions of the Habitat Conference, right, um, there were no local governments in the table, right? So Habitat 3 was the first time that mayors and local authorities had actually a voice and a way to contribute with ideas and input for the construction of what became later the new urban agenda, the declaration of Quito that was approved during Habitat 3. So that was a very important milestone that clearly exemplifies the way that cities are becoming an increasingly relevant global player, right? Uh, and that's not, not the only example. I mean, the fact of having SDG 11 being about urban issues is another clear example. Uh, the fact that during the uh, Paris uh, summit in 2015, where the, you know, the, the Paris Agreement was approved, there was a parallel mayoral summit very important one, discussing climate change issues. The fact that, uh, you know, um, the new urban agenda, as I said, had the participation of mayors. The fact that during the discussions and approval of the global compact on migration and refugees, which Penny just mentioned, also local authorities uh, had, a, had a role to play and a voice to speak are also important examples of this increasingly important role from cities in the global stage. And that not only applies to the UN ecosystem, but also in, in some other kind of fields, like for example, climate change through city networks uh, like C40, Absolutely. the Global yeah. Covenant of Mayors or ECLE that are very active in this regard and that have became very meaningful mechanisms for cities to achieve concrete policy outcomes through a global action channel. Great, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted you bring up the networks because that's obviously something very important to discuss. Uh, Robert, but maybe first you want to reflect uh, a little bit on this from your uh, experience also uh, working in UN Habitat. Sure, yes, thank you, Jana. Um, well, Again, as with the others, thank you very much to, to the hosts, the American Society for International Law, the City of The Hague, and yourself and the Asser Institute for making this possible. Um, it is wonderful to be able, as you, you mentioned, to be able to continue to do these kinds of meetings in this current situation, and actually sometimes to make them better, to bring in more people and a greater diversity of points of view, which I think has been a, a, one of the few bright lights of the current situation. Um, I think turning to the question at hand, I, I would want to make three points, really, from the point of view of Habitat. One is the, the nature of what we're talking about. Um, Habitat's mandate is essentially to, to help uh, countries have better urban development, better, you know, better in terms of uh, human dignity and, and standard of living outcomes for their citizens, better in terms of environmental outcomes, better in terms of sustainability. A lot of what goes on in the world happens in cities. 70% of GDP, probably an equivalent level of climate, climate uh, gases and impacts. Um, cities are disproportionately vulnerable to climate adaptation. Um, so whether it's economic, whether it's environmental, whether it's social, the majority of it tends to happen in cities in some form or another. So the idea that, that we could potentially discuss this aspect of development without having cities at the table is a very difficult thing to really understand. You have to deal with the people who deal with the problems day to day, both in terms of what the trade-offs are between, you know, what interest is it, what industries will we have, what economic activity will we have at what cost, but also the trade-offs for, for different types of impacts on the individual. So I think that that is really fundamentally a city focused thing. So we can't do our work without engaging with cities realistically. Yes, for a long time, the UN system has been somewhat conservative, but increasingly there has been political space to bring cities in. And for us as the secretariat, that makes our lives substantially easier because to have the people who are discussing our strategies and work plans actually discuss 
directly with the people, you know, so the member states who make the decisions about what we do, to have them discuss directly with the cities who are going to be implementing this and want to get what are their priorities on the table is a huge advantage for us as a secretariat. Mm. Um, I think also uh, th there's a, a related question around the way that, that we operate that relates to that. A lot of our work is, whether it's housing, whether it's basic services, whether it's land management, whether it's spatial planning, most of that activity tends to be done by city or provincial level agencies. Yes, national government may set some frameworks and some rules, but it's more likely to actually have departments at city level who are implementing and making day-to-day -day decisions. And very often those day-to-day -day decisions in planning, in water supply and everything else, have a much bigger impact on a citizen's direct life. So to be able to, to have that interaction there is important. I think um, two other changes that have, that have come through. One is mm. some of the nature of international law. Uh, for example, human rights frameworks very often shift outside of the normal framework of international law. They're not just about state-to-state -state relations. They create rights for the individuals as well. Mm -hmm. And very often cities are the ones who are interacting. We see, as, as Penny mentioned, with uh, some of the policing cases in the US, that is primarily an issue between citizens and their city authorities the, who are managing the policing of the cities. And that is fundamentally a rights question, which is connected into international law frameworks. So cities are coming much more directly into that, not only because they want to, but also because their citizens insist that they be accountable for it. And then finally, you know, the same thing that has made our meeting possible now, technology. Yeah. Cities can coordinate in a way that they never have before. They can share information all over the world, not just somebody who is within reach or a telephone call or a fax machine. Now, whether it's Africa, Asia, the US, you can have a video connection, you can share files, you can share whatever you like. So when we as the forum for cities are trying to look at what are the patterns, what's going on globally, the city associations and the others who are coordinating on these issues create a huge advantage because there is already some level of common understanding that you can pull together and then bring to that UN platform and engage with states at that, at that level collectively. So I think all of these things come together to say not only do we need to have cities more engaged, but a lot of the factors that are pushing us at the moment are driving in that direction as well to say, I don't want to just hear what my president or prime minister has to say. I need to know what the mayor is actually going to do about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All. Yeah, I know exactly. And that's what I hear in all of all of your comments so far. And Helmut, I'm turning to you. But cities as change makers uh, and um, also uh, Penny is saying they're, we're non-state actors indeed. At the same time, obviously part of states. So that's where complications come in, one would say, uh, and where traditionally international organizations and international law were so state oriented, that's where things become to move, right? Tensions and opportunities arise. And, and I, I guess that's where, where in international law and international organization studies where we're kind of waking up uh, and Helmut, uh, maybe we're late to the party as, as uh, international lawyers, but they're questions coming up increasingly uh, within international law. Yes, yes, indeed, Jana, and uh, many, many thanks also from my side for, for setting up this panel to you and all the other organizers. Um, international law scholarship is in a way late to the party, as you, as you have just said, and um, other disciplines, urban scholars, sociologists, they have, uh, they have taken note of this development of the growing global dimension of what cities do much earlier. And in a way, I think uh, this has to do with a certain inherent conservatism of law as a, as a discipline, where uh, law is always looking at formal, the formal side of things, and uh, it takes a certain time for law to catch up with real-world developments. Um, this is not necessarily a vice. It can also be a virtue, as it also prevents international law from just collapsing into a reproduction of whatever is going on in the world. So this being late to the party uh, may not necessarily be, be a bad thing. Um, but I think we have now reached um, a moment where international law as a, as a discipline, as a field of practice, 
has indeed to catch up with this reality as um, this growing importance of the global dimension of what cities do is increasingly difficult to ignore. And I think this has two dimensions to it. Um, on the one hand, we have this bottom-up uh, development where cities themselves uh, establish networks, form coalitions, uh, claim a global role for themselves, um, as was already described by Penny and Mauricio, um, all these networks. And on the other hand, we have the top-down perspective, where also the established actors in international law and global governance uh, take increasingly notice of that. They recognize the importance of local governments, cities as stakeholders for the implementation of international law, also for the further development of international law. And these two processes, bottom-up and top-down, come together and thereby, to a certain extent, push international lawyers a bit out of their comfort zone uh, because cities are weird creatures uh, for international law. And this has to do with this um, characterization that also Penny um, gave at the beginning. We are non-state actors. Uh, cities indeed are, but uh, when you approach the question of what cities do from the traditional established doctrines of international law, you can easily say, well, whatever a city does eventually ends up as some kind of state conduct. You can, you can see that as some kind of practice for the interpretation of international law, for the generation of customary international law. When a city does something wrong, it can trigger state responsibility for the state not having complied with its obligations under investment law or human rights law. So under the traditional category, the city remains bound up uh, in, this, in the state apparatus. And I think this duality being a non-state actor with an independent identity and being a state organ makes cities much more intriguing and complicated cases than um, all the other many important non-state actors that, that we have grown accustomed to in international law, as international law remains state-centric, but of course mm. it has broadly expanded its horizons in the last uh, decades to include a multitude of other actors. Absolutely, and that I guess is the... Is the, the um, fascination we have at the moment. And so if we build on these uh, comments, uh, Penny and Mauricio, I think this, this bottom-up movement that, that uh, Helmut describes, uh, do you indeed uh, recognize this? Uh, I think both of you mentioned how you deliberately go to the global level because that's where you want to have influence. That's where the lawmaking and the decision-making is taking place. Um, uh, is that, yeah, how, how is that, how are you doing that? How are you involved in that? Of course, together, but, but also individually as, as cities. Mauricio, maybe you want to, oh, Penny, yeah, who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I was just uh, laughing at the last thing Robert said. Well, first of all, we see it as um, reflecting our community voices, less the bottom up, but actually getting the, the democracy and the citizen, citizen's voice um, into, into the global conversation. Yeah. Um, but I was laughing at what Robert said, where you know you have your president or your prime minister say something, but they want to know what their mayors are doing about it. Um, in the US right now, it's what are we doing that is opposite to what our president <laughs> is saying, whether it is on you know, refugees and, and immigration and climate change. Um, you know, this, this has just been, you know, I, I work with Maurizio, we are part of a lot of collectives. It has been very important into, you know, just um, honoring what Helmut said and, you know, what international law and governance is. What cities can do is influence the conversation while the legal scholars are trying to figure out how to formalize what this influence actually is. But this has been extremely important. So Maurizio brought up the Global Compact on Migration. New York City was part of the leadership that brought together 50 domestic and global voices to the table. It was the first time that the UN invited city voices during the negotiations. Mm -hmm. The mayor of Bristol came to the, I was sat next to him, came to the UN General Assembly and spoke about, at the end of the day, one of the limitations of cities is that we don't control the flow of people that are coming in. But the reality is, is that we have to deal with our new neighbors, whether it's mm -hmm. around policing, whether around their access to healthcare and education. And so this is a voice that needs to be heard. We don't control the visas at the border, but we deal with the reality of the people now in our cities. And so how are we best then serving them to protect our larger community. And so I think it is a recognition of not only the UN, um, Murcio and I are part of 
a collective called the U20. New York City was one of the founding um, organizations for the U20. But how do we influence the G20, right? By working through communiques that are then given to their Sherpas to be able to ensure that the G20 are able to consider urban issues as they're con considering global issues. And again, to me, this is this, part of this movement of, um, of influence. And we've been working in New York City very closely with UN Habitat. So one of the ways that we had seen, quite honestly, very early on to ensure that um, American voices were heard around the sustainable development goals was we created the concept of a voluntary local review. This is based on... Yeah. Please. on a national Never governments yeah. submitting voluntary national reviews in terms of where they are in achieving um, the sustainable development goals every summer during the high-level political forum, which this year will be work virtual for the first time, as will um, likely much of the UN General Assembly. But this voluntary local review was something that we actually talked to UN senior leadership about, the executive director of um, UN Habitat, and they said, we'd love this idea. We'll actually work with you to create like a formal mechanism where cities can submit this to the United Nations. And so now we have over 200 local governments that have committed to the New York City Declaration to do a voluntary local review. And this is not about cities against member states. We are not trying to usurp member state power. We're just saying that we need to be one of the key critical voices that are heard for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And then as a collective, what cities are doing is we don't want to continue to have to be able to create new ideas. We want to replicate what's working and what is the best mechanism to share that by using the framework and the language of the sustainable development goals. So my last international trip actually before COVID hit was to the World Urban Forum in, um, in, in the UAE and the, the head of UN Habitat and myself um, co-chaired a session on the voluntary local review where she asked a call to action to all the mayors that were at the World Urban Forum to participate in the voluntary local review. So you can see not only the UN arm, but national governments appreciating the importance of city voices being in this, right? And again, this is about the influence, the influence with, with we use with policy collaboration or we're able to do through the collective power of coalitions like the U20 or UCLG or ICLEI. Yeah, that's that's. But to pick up on that, and, and Mauricio, of course, uh, of course, uh, I, I come to you. But but isn't it always that states or countries are supportive? Isn't there also something of a tension that that we can say, looking back, UN Habitat exists for for decades. Uh, it's now indeed inviting cities, but one could also say there it, it has taken its time. Uh, isn't the relationship between the international, the state and the city also uh, a complicated one? It's yes. maybe, yeah, maybe I hand over to Mauricio. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, it, it is. It is. And there's, this is a very important uh, point. I mean, there's uh, a, a, an a extremely relevant dimension when it comes to the kind of policies you want to deliver locally, and you have to struggle with political disputes nationally, right? Actually, I experienced that heavily during my first, first three years in office, right? There was not a good relationship with the president, and that was a, a clear obstacle to deliver local action, and that's why the international arena becomes extremely helpful. Right, because there's a lot of things that you can achieve through global action locally. Going back to my first point, now uh, cities for a long time have been struggling to get what's called a seat at the global table, right? Mm -hmm. And I argue that in some arenas we have already achieved a seat at the global table. I mean, going back to Robert's point, uh, it is true that, uh, and I have to acknowledge that that there has been a lot of progress in the UN ecosystem to allow cities to speak, to provide mayors with, you know, a space to, to contribute, uh, to give ideas that have nurtured uh, important international treaties such as the new urban agenda, like I mentioned during my first intervention. Now, there's, there's some other spaces in which there's a kind of de facto seat at the global table for cities. And, uh, and that's where I, I think that international law can become an extremely helpful tool to develop because that's not regulated yet. A clear example for that 
is international cities financing, right? The international financing architecture was not designed for cities. It was designed for countries. But since, you know, cities are where the most pressing issues globally will be defined, like global uh, climate change, like migration, you know, the SDGs, etc. Since there's that need for cities to develop new infrastructure and services that would allow them to meet these important international goals, like the SDGs, the Paris Agreement, the New Urban Agenda, etc., they need resources, they need financing, and they, they need to get that through an international financial ecosystem that was designed for countries, not for cities. So what we are witnessing right now is a kind of a global movement of you know, new financial players, new financial tools or, or mechanisms, new funds, new bonds, new technical assistant uh, facilities designed for cities to access to international financing without a global international law regulation for that. But that's already happening. So again, I think that's why uh, the topic that we are addressing today is so timely. It is extremely uh, relevant because uh, even more so in, 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 view, in view of what the world and cities are facing regarding COVID-19, right? Mm -hmm. We are witnessing how there's you know, many recovery packages being set up, many funds to stimulate uh, you know, the, the, the economic movement in cities and in countries uh, after COVID. And we need to make sure that an important portion of those resources will be directly dispersed into cities. Now, how is that regulated, right? What's the legal framework for that globally, right? So, so again, that's why this is a, such an important topic and uh, uh, definitely a conversation that needs to keep happening at different levels. Absolutely, and, and I'm sure we'll continue the conversation. And what I hear from both of you is indeed also, uh, uh, Robert, uh, I, I, I'm coming to you, uh, is, is a call for, for change, actually, even maybe more of international law and international organizations, right? Because if you need an international law that takes care of these kind of things, and you need international organizations to have an eye for these urban dimensions and for these urban uh, the, um, Im implications of global challenges, um, how, how do you do that? And, and maybe you are in the front line of, of developing that, taking cities on board in processes and, and in lawmaking, both hard and, and soft law. Uh, I, I smile slightly because I think, you know, very often as the UN Secretariat, we are Rather than the front line, we are some usually some sort of punching bag in the middle of two different front lines. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that is important to remember is that as the Secretariat, we have a limited ability to actually push things forward in our on our own. I mean, we can make recommendations to to member states. We can look at how to create more space for different uh, different options, but very frequently we're we're told what we can and cannot do, um, which does create some significant constraints. Mm -hmm. But I mean, certainly the ways that we're looking at things, I mean, you know, the, the very common sort of roots of international law process in a way of a lot of things coming out of practice. Our area might not be all that familiar to international lawyers in a lot of instances, you know, when we're talking about water and sanitation or power supplies or financing issues or whatever. But we deal a lot with cities directly on those questions. We, at that level, we it's usually seen as a technical issue when we're able to look at creative solutions. Those in some instances then may become guidelines um, and those guidelines may start to graduate from, from softer instruments into more legally definable instruments. Um, you know, we, we have recently, for example, uh, the Habitat Assembly approved the, the UN guidelines on urban safety. Um, that obviously uh, has unfortunately become a, a headline issue again, um, the question of crime prevention and urban safety. Those principles start to become more relevant as people refer to them and they establish them. 
now in a way that is beginning to become soft law and it is something that was created in partnership with a wide diversity of cities and city-based actors and community representatives. Um, a similar thing is beginning, I don't know where it'll end up, but it's beginning to go on at the moment, for example, with something we call the city's investment facility, which is intended to address some of the financing questions that, that, that were just raised by the other panelists. So we're trying to look at how at ways to connect international finance, either with cities or with particular projects within cities, and look at what the guarantees and the frameworks for the financing around that are. And again, hopefully there is a way that that, that soft element of international law will grow into something that is more widely accepted and is more stable going forward. Our aim while doing that is also to try and say that rather than it being a free-for-all um, in the sense that very often we end up with a situation where cities with weaker capacity or who are smaller or more vulnerable, more marginalised from the system essentially don't get a lot of say in what they accept. They just get told this is what's on offer, take it or leave it. If we can create a more level playing field where they can get easy access to understanding of how things can be done and what their choices are and what good practice is, then we can try and build a, a bit more on the international framework that level. And But also we can work with cities a little bit to, to push back on some of the things with finance areas, technology companies and others to say these are some of the principles that we want to adhere to no matter what. If you're not prepared to, to accept those principles, then we're not going to engage. I mean, that can be an extreme example of a situation. But for example, um, there's a lot of issues now around digital technology, facial recognition, personal data, all of these issues. I think there are standards that are emerging very rapidly saying if you're not prepared to uphold these standards, then we're not going to deal with you. And and I think cities are, are fundamental in shaping now what the details of those are before the discussion with the member states tends to start. And then very often it means that the member states are not driving the whole agenda in the way that they might have done 50 years ago. They're more looking at, okay, what is the, the customary reality? And then how will the states try and adapt or, or push, push that around, change it slightly? But the, the stage has already very often been set, set by cities in those instances. But having said that, it's still very difficult. Um, there aren't formal ways in many forums where a city at the final decision-making stage where they're still there and able to influence as much more than an observer. So there's still further to go. Yeah. Now, I'm very glad you bring up this point that the city doesn't exist, right? And, and uh, there, there's, all cities are different. And also how all this, how this dynamic plays out in cities is, is different. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, there are cities with, with housing challenges that are incomprehensible and incomparable to cities where, for instance, uh, Helmut or I are, are uh, living at the moment. I mean, especially you and Habitat is, is working on that. Um, also, you, you all mentioned the fact that, um, yeah, there, there are global challenges that actually hit the street in cities, right? And uh, this, you mentioned, um, finances as necessary to, to tackle these challenges. Um, um, Robert, you give a few uh, fields that are important uh, in your work. We also have to think indeed of migration that was mentioned, uh, human rights, um, all areas where cities mobilize international law, you could say, uh, and influence and, and change how international law is developing. So Helmut, how do you reflect on that? How do you look at that? Is, is there something really changing about international law? Um, is, is international law being able to be responsive uh, if you uh, accumulate all these different fields together? Do you see a changing position of, international, uh, of, of the city? And also, is that only of a, something like a promise? Uh, aren't there also complications there? 
Um, yeah, very, very good and intriguing questions. Um, I think it very much depends on your on your definition of international law, um, how rigidly you define the boundaries of, of the discipline and uh, whether you cling to a more traditional state-centric uh, definition of what international law is or whether you are more open for transnational law variations of, of, of international law or some kind of global law. And when we focus on, on lawmaking, for, for a moment, I think we can also distinguish here between different settings. Um, the traditional process of treaty making, um, I would say, is so far mostly unaffected by the rise of cities. And states will not easily make room at the negotiation table when the really final decisions are, are being made. But at the same time, I think at the moment we can see that... Um, uh, the negotiation of, of large multilateral agreements is not the top priority of states too. So the fact that states uh, do not make room for cities when they conclude new important multilateral agreements might not actually matter that much. And what matters much more are more informal processes around the existing normative framework. And there I think cities have uh, multiple uh, points where they can enter the conversation. Uh, this can be uh, meetings of the parties, as we know it in the climate change context, uh, the work of secretariats, treaty bodies, courts and tribunals. And here cities can, can make their voices heard and they can, they can contribute to what is a very open textual process of the interpretation and um, development of international law. And especially through the work of international institutions, we see a lot of direct engagement with the city level, which in some cases can be some kind of bypass around uh, national sovereignty. And, and the state uh, is not always asked uh, about these direct contacts between these international institutions and cities and their networks. And I think it, it's immediately we can think of many positive uh, implications that this bypass has, but uh, it, it may not also always just be positive. And um, in any case, I would say that we need to look more also at the different um, domestic constitutional frameworks, which condition um, the, the possibilities of participation for cities in that regard. Um, we need, uh, so to speak, a comparative foreign relations law for the powers of uh, cities and local governments to engage in these processes. And this uh, comparative foreign relations law then also needs to be sensitive to questions of democratic legitimacy, accountability, transparency. If we think of these new, of this need for new finance, um, this is very plausible, of course, and there's, a, there's an urgent need to think in this direction, but it also exposes cities to um, to, to, to powers outside uh, of, of, of their scope of influence, which might also abuse that capability to, to sell um, finance products to, to cities and local governments. Yeah. Penny, I saw you nodding a lot uh, when, when Helmut was, uh, was speaking. It seemed to resonate. It does. I mean, you know, these are, these are the challenges that we consider as we, you know, these are things that I think about as I continue to figure out how to assert New York City's voice in certain conversations, whether it's at the UN. And, you know, when your, um, your, your last comment was there's going to be tensions between city, state, you know, um, national government. I mean, there couldn't be a, a, a greater tension between mm -hmm. the Trump administration and the values of New Yorkers and New York City uh, within the de Blasio administration, right? So I am very thoughtful about the points that Helmut made when I, the way I speak with, inside the UN, right? The mm -hmm. US mission to the UN formally represents member states. And so we have a very important working relationship with our national government. And we have to ensure that as we continue to promote the policies and what's important for our ground up, for our communities, um, that we are doing it in a thoughtful way, recognizing what those tensions are with our national government as well. And part of the reason I talked about the voluntary local review and how many um, sort of local governments have joined onto it, it has been particularly important to get the support of member states and national governments to ensure that this voluntary local review is going to be a success. The first city that joined us after this was the city of Helsinki in Finland. And that was a very important partnership because the Finnish government actively embraced it. They actually brought me to Helsinki to meet with 
local governments around um, regional uh, mayors around uh, around Finland because they know that having their communities activated around the SDGs just strength strengthens their voluntary national review. So this is you know this is about both uh, balancing the tension that Helmut is talking about as you continue to assert yourself because our voices need to be there. Yes. And, and Mauricio, is, is there exactly on that point something that has changed with respect to the city networks uh, in the sense that they have become, they increased in, in number, uh, they have been more active. UCLG, its predecessors existed 100 years ago, but there's something innovative going on at the moment, right? Yes, yes. I think uh, city networks are becoming a, an increasingly important mechanism for cities advocacy at the global uh, stage, um, and even more so if we look at specific topics. Uh, I already mentioned some of the networks that are focused on climate change. Uh, you also have uh, a new network of cities uh, being focused on migration. It's, it's fairly new, uh, the Mayor's Migration Council. Uh, Penny already mentioned the U20, which I think it's a very interesting example of how city networks work is evolving in terms of not creating new networks, but actually joining efforts to create new city initiatives around specific topics. In the case of the U20, like Penny said earlier, you know, creating an engagement mechanism for cities with the G20 countries, which is an extremely relevant uh, topic. That's why I, re I always argue that cities already have a seat at the global table. This is an, another example of that. Now it's, uh, it's about making good use of that seat at the global table. And that's why I think that, you know, the concept of international local government's law, going back to the concept mm -hmm. from Logan Baron, becomes extremely, extremely relevant uh, to develop at this point. Uh, even more so in view of the fact that, I mean, let's be clear, if we want to meet the SDGs, we want to meet the Paris Agreement, we need cities to perform extremely well, right? And the international system has not been thinking about that for many years. Now it's kind of doing so, but we have to make progress as a, a, in a, at a much um, faster pace mm. because we are running out of time. I mean, we know we don't have too much time to meet the SDGs and the Paris Agreement, right? If we think about the fact that 70% of CO2 emissions are being generated by cities, it is exactly. a city where the Paris Agreement will be met or not. And the only way that it will do so is by having cities actively being actively engaged in international discussions uh, being able to access to international financing to transform uh, the infrastructure they have and make it climate friendly uh, and to address some extremely pressing issues like pandemics, mm -hmm. like migration and some other uh, external shocks that are already happening and will keep on happening in the future. Yeah. And so, Robert, maybe also from your experience uh, with, uh, with international organizations at large, uh, this is, uh, again, a call for partnership, right? And, and it was Kofi Annan, I think, in 2001, who actively, or who said explicitly, we need local governments. Uh, uh, th this, is, this is a continuous call uh, um, on, on, uh, for collaboration. Um, how, how is it... Uh, um, made possible? How is it feasible also from the international organization side? I mean, you mentioned, well, we can only do so much. Uh, at the same time, it seems also part of a sort of democratic legitimacy to, to partner up with, with cities, uh, also reasons of uh, effectiveness. Um, how do you see that if, you, if I ask you to look into the, the near future, uh, will other international organizations indeed continue in, in strengthening these partnerships or how do you estimate that? I think there's always going to be a bit of a, a backwards and forwards, you know, I don't, is it backwards and forwards or is it a roller coaster relationship? <laughs> there are going to be moments when the international community is 
as member states is keener to bring cities into the table and there are going to be moments when they're less keen. I think it's going to, for example, at the moment, we're generally not in a very multilateral frame of mind globally. Um, a lot of member states are pulling them back from member states from, from multilateral approaches. So I think on the one hand that has its advantages because it creates a little bit of space in the debates where, where member states are not dominating so aggressively um, that allows others to, to join the discussion more actively. But I think we're also in a period where we're finding that we need a more diverse range of actors. Um, you know, both Penny and Mauricio have, have referred to situations where you almost need cities and other actors to be able to fix the problem. And for example, we're finding this increasingly, migration have been mentioned, development issues have been mentioned, but even in the humanitarian field, conflict is often occurring in cities and cities are almost kind of neutral actors between some of the, the, the warring parties in terms of they're much more focused on just service delivery to their citizens. And that opens up a more neutral space for discussion and allows you to work around the more ideological side. So I think the more you shift towards the technical, the citizen oriented, the delivery oriented, the more space there is for cities. The more you move towards the purely political and ideological, the more that states will push them away and try to dominate the agenda. So I think there'll always be a little bit of a shift. But I think we are heading in the direction where it is irreversible because the information is out there. Everybody can connect in a way they couldn't. That allows people to, to build up their influence and authority in a way they couldn't before. And you can't escape the fact that cities are usually the primary agents of delivering services. They're the contact point with most of the citizens of a country. Yeah. They have uh, to solve the problems and they have to meet uh, their citizens. Uh, and Absolutely. sometimes In they need to, the, sorry. Yeah. Okay. sorry, just to say, sometimes they also need, cities aren't saints in all cases and aren't exactly. perfect. Yeah. You sometimes need a framework to bring them together and get some peer pressure to say, this is the standard we want you all to come up to. It's both ways. Exactly. So, so it, we should also recognize, which I understand from your comment, the fact that uh, maybe some of the problems come, that come with, with states will also come with, with cities. And yet the confrontation, the direct confrontation with people is very important. So I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're um, starting to, to come to the end of this uh, uh, conversation. Uh, Helmut, uh, I, I thought I saw you lean in to come with a, maybe a last <laughs> reflection before. Yeah, maybe just, just two brief points, one in agreement with right. Robert and one in slight disagreement. Um, the, the, the point of agreement is that uh, the, the, certain uncertain, the, the current uncertainty around states opens up indeed uh, these opportunities for cities to step in. And that's, that's an opportunity, but it also it's somehow weakens the possibility for, for, for sustainable reform at the moment as cities would also need supportive states in order to consolidate that position further. And this, I think, might be difficult at the moment. And this, the slight note of disagreement, uh, the technical versus political, I think there's a delicate balance here, also with questions of democratic legitimacy on which mm -hmm. cities also rely often. And the more you focus then on technical aspects, I think uh, the more problematic becomes this argument, we as cities are closest to the people and we have a specific form of democratic legitimacy. Yeah. Thank you so much for adding that. And, and again, that goes to, to that point that there is no something like the city, uh, even though we've tried to explore uh, the, the, the relation to it between cities and, and the international level. And I'm very grateful to, to all of you for, for that um, exercise. Uh, and all within an hour, we, we explored the landscape, but obviously cities are very, very different um, uh, and, and all come with different Questions. That said, I think we've uh, started to, to look at these questions, see the opportunities, see the issues that will come. And I want to thank you very, very much for everything you said today. And I hope we continue the conversation. So thank you to the American Society. And I look forward, and I think all of us look forward to a next annual meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'd like to thank Yana and all of the panelists for that valuable discussion. This closing plenary has traditionally concluded the annual meeting with a lunch reception. Although it's not possible to hold that reception today, we wanted to find a way to recreate the sense of community that accompanied that tradition. Our technology committee consisting of Beck Hamilton, Karina Googler and Anupam Chander set about the task of building that community feeling by incorporating a number of new interactive elements into the meeting, including the Ask Me Anything and small group mentoring sessions that have taken place over the, over the last two days. I'd like to thank them for all of their ideas, their creativity, and their hard work. So now we would like to raise a glass to toast you, our community. On Tuesday, you should have received an invitation with instructions for preparing the signature drink created expressly for this occasion by two members of our community, Beth George and Tess Bridgman. I hope you've had an opportunity to prepare it at home, and I invite you to charge your glasses as I tell you a bit about its origins. Beth and Tess have named their creation the Charming Betsy after a merchant ship of that name that was the subject of one of the earliest US Supreme Court cases related to international law. The Charming Betsy was a neutral Danish vessel that in the summer of 1800 fell into the hands of French privateers who thought it was an American vessel. It was recaptured on the high seas by an American naval captain who also believed it to be American and sold in a forfeiture action in Philadelphia pursuant to a US statute. The ship quickly became a pawn in French-U.S. aggressions that were at the high tide at the time. The debacle that followed involved intrigue on the high seas and raised difficult questions of the law of nations at the very highest levels of the U.S., French, and Danish governments. Decided in 1804, the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in this case is celebrated for its declaration of a principle known as the Charming Betsy Doctrine, which says that an act of Congress ought never to be construed to violate the law of nations if any other possible construction remains. And so as a story of turmoil ending in the vindication of the law of nations, the charming Betsy is the perfect name for an acel cocktail. The schooner had previously been known as the Jane and that is the name of the alcohol-free version of our cocktail. Another of the brilliant ideas of the technology committee was to ask annual meeting attendees to share a photo of themselves living their lives in this time of COVID-19 and to combine the images into the photo montage that you're now seeing on your screen. We hope that this visual representation will personify the ASL community in all its strength, resilience, and diversity. So against this backdrop of you art members, I invite you now to raise your glass and join me in a toast to the promise of international law and to you. I truly wish I could see you all. And this will come as a surprise to Tiller House, but hold on to your cocktails because I'd also like to toast Mark, our fearless executive director, Wes, our meeting mastermind, Jimmy, our tech whiz, and to Beth, Ben and Justine, Ursula, and all of the other Tiller House staff that have made this remarkable event possible. They put in literally hundreds of hours to make this a seamless experience. Cheers to you and thank you so much. So friends, thank you for being a part of this special gathering. Please mark your calendars for the 2021 meeting, which will take place on March 24th to 27th. The annual meeting co-chairs Simone Badefort, Christy Edwards and Darren Johnson invite your ideas for sessions, reflecting the meeting's theme, reconceiving international law, creativity in times of crisis. The deadline is soon, it's coming July 17th. So we will reconvene in Washington DC in 2021, hopefully in person if the world cooperates. I now declare the 114th annual meeting of the American Society of International Law adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and stay well. <laughs>